Hi, yeah. So I'm talking today about um, economy of process in Walt Siegel's work, uh, uh, economy of construction process, but also of design process, and following on from um, Asley's talk, interesting also an economy of drawing. And I'm uh, talking in particular about this journey um, that uh, from Siegel's own Highgate Temporary House to the uh, later Lewisham self-built projects. So um, in uh, 1963, Walt Siegel faced a dual dilemma. In the broadest sense, uh, he felt he'd engaged in what he described as a 30 year war with the traditional processes of getting buildings built. By this, he meant struggles with bureaucracies, struggles with traditional masonry construction, and struggles with the system of contractors and contracting. Uh, I'd suggest these frustrations might be understood as being between the imposed distances between architects, clients, and builders, and also through that, the imposed distance between uh, design and construction. Uh, he wrote at the time or later, uh, I built 30 houses in London before 1962, and it was becoming really warfare. I found it harder and harder, and I longed to get out. But at this time, he also faced an immediate problem. He was building a new home for himself in Highgate in brick construction, uh, and this involved the demolition of their existing house. Uh, this is the project to the bottom of the page. And because of this demolition, he needed to house his family for the duration of the building works. He did this by building a temporary structure to the rear, later known as the little house in the garden to the top of the page. Significantly, and significantly for today's talk, uh, the budget for the temporary house was to come from the budget for the main house. Uh, so what he spent on the temporary house, he couldn't spend on the main house. And in addition, the temporary house only had a temporary planning permission. So he sought to build a cheap, quick and demountable building, hoping to keep as much money as possible for the main house build. He also hoped through the manner in which uh, the building was demountable to recoup some of the material costs through resale at the end of the temporary life, uh, temporary project's life. The house was very uh, compactly planned with a central living room, which the other rooms looked onto, almost a covered in courtyard. And it was built with a lightweight timber frame with a post sitting on concrete paving slabs, unfixed and with no foundations uh, below. The walls were clad in mineral felt, similar to the roof, with visible fixing patterns. And the felt roof was not fixed to the substrate, simply weighed down by loose laid bricks, see this uh, attractive grid, uh, and one and a half inches of water that uh, the weight of the water weighed it down and Siegel would top this up with a hose uh, when needed during hot weather. Um, Siegel here in this building uh, succeeded in producing an extraordinarily cheap building. And the structure was erected in only 10 weeks and cost approximately one tenth the price of the main uh, house he was constructing per square meter. Um, uh, this main house using more traditional construction. He achieved this by working back to first principles and simplifying as much as he possibly could. Uh, soon after its completion, uh, the house was published in the architectural press in 1966, but also in the mainstream press. Articles like this one, this is the headline uh, strap, uh, articles like this one in the Financial Times focused on the remarkable low cost of the project. Um, uh, saying, a home for less than £900, frame house uh, of ready-made parts, a four-bedroom home at a cost in labour and materials of £854, eight shillings and five pence, a precise enough figure. 
erected in 10 weeks is a phenomenon worth noticing. Uh, the remarkable economy of the project quickly and this, uh, um, these mainstream articles quickly led for a demand for similar houses from pri private clients. And over the next few years, Siegel completed a number of private houses in timber frame construction, all of them on extremely low budgets uh, and on fast programs. This image shows one of the first projects, uh, Bally Garrett House in Ireland that was completed in 1968, built in just a three week holiday uh, with the client working together with a carpenter. Um, like the, like Siegel's own house, this has uh, mineral felt cladding on the walls, but uh, it's one of the last projects to have this. This uh, image shows the Collier House or Tree House in Halstead in Essex from 1969. Here, uh, the felt uh, walling is replaced with uh, asbestos panels, which are available in a number of colors. And here in 1970, a house uh, in Sussex, uh, in contrast to the Highgate house, um, he started here uh, uh, detailing an overhanging roof that projects forwards. And this playroom in Wembley, also from 1970, completed on site in just three years. So this quick succession of uh, projects um, uh, following on from the house, um, developed and progressed the ideas he had there. And a number of details varied from the little house. Um, it was a process of gradual refinement. Um, but to a large extent, in the Highgate house, he'd already solved how to build cheaply. And this process of refinement was instead oriented towards translating this logic of cheapness and quickness uh, into. Um, uh, towards uh, um, these permanent structures away from the temporary um, nature of the Highgate house. And so contrasting this later typical detail section of one of the later houses with the Highgate house, uh, you can see um, the introduction, sorry, I'm going to point out some of the things on the detail, the introduction of pebbles to the roof in view of the water, the um, overhanging roof here in lieu of the flush profile, the change in wall cladding from um, felt to asbestos or fiber cement, and at the bottom, the introduction of these um, uh, concrete foundations beneath the paving slabs. However, although the um, details were progressed and refined, developed towards making this uh, logic applicable to a permanent structures, the key principles of all these later buildings were established in the Highgate of Temporary House and refined here, developing into what was later categorized as the Siegel method. The key to the construction logic of this method and these buildings, all of these buildings, is the use of off the shelf materials. These elements were readily available and mass produced. Siegel saying later, my my main idea has been to use materials and their market sizes fixed to a framework. So this uh, schedule of Siegel lists the key sheet materials used in the houses. You see the materials on the left and the dimensions and uh, along with the imperial dimensions, significantly the widths here of uh, all of these materials available in two foot or four foot widths. Um, in particular, it's worth noting the um, wood wall slabs here, which are two inches thick. Uh, their um, versions. Um, in part, Siegel was encountering a level of dimensional coordination that already existed in industry, but he was also proactively selecting uh, specific materials for their dimensional compatibility. Siegel significantly was not attempting to invent, design, or standardize a production process or system. And he was not designing components or joints to be manufactured. Instead, he was observing the coordination that already existed in industrial production 
and seeking to best utilize, combine and assemble these ready-made building products. Uh, writing at the time, I slithered into the discovery, shamefully late, that a market of mass produced materials does exist and by and large, there are many materials that are dimensionally coordinated that you only have to buy and assemble. Within this process of assembly, the materials were fitted into a timber post and beam structure with minimal on-site alterations, as few cuts as possible on site, and as little change to their finish or appearance and only using dry jointing. The frame was therefore dimensioned according to the standard sizes available in these sheet materials. The wood wall slabs particularly significant here. So this key detail uh, makes clear the overall constructional logic of Siegel's method. The wood wall slab comes in two foot by two inches or later 600 by 50 slabs. So the walls have a two inch thick core or of lengths that are a factor of this number of panels. The panels are spaced 50 millimeters apart to allow cross walls where necessary. And after linings here are applied to either side, also minimally altered, timber battens are bolted tight to secure the, ball, the wall buildup. So the wall is held together without glue or screws, instead relying on pressure and friction, friction from these battens. a nice drawing uh, regarding the economy. So the detail suggests a dimensional arrangement, an elimination of unnecessary alterations and a manner of connection that is dry, flexible and adaptable. And the detail leads to a basic tartan grid, two foot by two inch spacings, on which all the house plans were based. And in combination, this grid and this construction logic leads to house plans such as this from one of the later Lewisham phase one works, where the walls are drawn as modules of these two foot, two inch slabs. And other elements such as windows, doors, stairs are designed to dimensionally coordinate. The logic continues through all the details. So the doors fit largely into the grid, 600 single doors or 1200 double doors. And pursuing the logic of dry fit, the roofing edge, felt edge is clamped tight, but the roof is neither bonded to the substrate or screw fixed or bonded at the edge indeed, allowing thermal movement. The emission of wet trades and the reduction in secondary alteration of materials transform the nature of on-site work towards a process of assembly. This, together with a reduction in the number of trades involved, led to a rigorous simplification of the building process. In these private commissions, Siegel was able to manage the projects without a main contractor, a carpenter doing the majority of the works, sometimes assisted by a client, electricians, plumbers and roofers contributing when needed. So this list here suggests in those first few projects I was showing from 68 to 70, um, the labor force, a client plus one carpenter, one carpenter, one carpenter, two carpenters, one carpenter with a client. Eventually, and perhaps inevitably, a client observing the remarkable economy and simplicity of building process decided to take on the buildings, the projects construction themselves. The clients for the Holland House, shown here in Suffolk, were a pair of young teachers who'd seen a Siegel House published in the mainstream press. As with Siegel's previous clients, the Hollands had been closely involved in the design process. Operating within the logic of the method, Siegel gave them space to design the uh, layout, clad and color, amongst other things. In Siegel's telling, after observing the carpenters on site on the first day, the client called Siegel and said the men weren't required and that they themselves could complete the works. In parallel to the simplification of construction and building process, Siegel's own working method also undertook a 
process of simplification that reinforced his own independence. Apart from periods at the beginning and end of his career, he worked alone without assistance. He worked without structural engineers doing all his own calculations. This is a page from the Holland House just shown. And he also worked without quantity surveyors doing all his own schedules. And by this time, Siegel had also simplified his drawings and information to build from. For each project, there was a set of specific A4 freehand drawings. Uh, these are the ones for the Holland House. Site plans, plan. It's kind of uh, elevations, remarkable um, economy of these drawings. And a specific schedule of materials that he would produce himself. Uh, this is the uh, schedule for the Holland House with these kind of various drawings that he would add into the col columns to kind of supplement the um, the numerical information. But he also at this time developed a generic set of information applicable to the projects, comprising a 20 page uh, catalog of elements. That is a standard set of details. This is a sample page uh, showing the possible wall details. Actually, the external wall details are pretty identical to the internal wall details. And there are a corner, mid wall, junction, and to a door. And there was also a nine page sequence of erection and assembly, a written document common to each project that describes the process of construction step by step. As his private clients took over uh, ever greater proportions of the construction work themselves, Siegel saw the methods potential for self-build and was keen to apply this to social housing schemes. Around this time, Siegel's contemporaries and colleagues, writers like John Turner, the author of Freedom to Build, and Siegel's friend, the anarchist Colin Ward, were suggesting greater dweller control within housing provision as an alternative to top-down solutions. Eventually, through Colin Ward and the deputy borough architect, Brian Richardson, amongst others, an opportunity arose in the London borough, borough of Lewisham. The council was to provide the land, the government, the money for materials, and the self-builders, the labor. On completion, the houses were transferred to a shared ownership scheme where the self-builders owned 50% through a council-backed mortgage and 50% was paid as rent to the council. Four sites were selected for 14 houses, all of them on steeply sloping, sloping uh, sites that were deemed unsuitable for standard housing solutions. The majority of the houses were single story as the previous private houses, but two story solutions were introduced at this stage. This is uh, uh, the site in Bromley for two of the houses. One of these was the first Siegel self build to be completed. This is the largest of the phase one sites in Forest Hill, uh, seven single story houses in what was to become Siegel Close. These share at the front here, a communal parking area that allowed access from a shared lane. And two sites close to together in Sydenham for five houses, including here, um, two paired two story houses. And the design for these paired houses was fairly typical, compact and efficient, always detached so that the self builders could construct their houses at their own speeds, independent from their neighbors. And the roof plan of one of these houses, which is determined by a regular layout of the wood wall slabs that we saw, the timber frame below and the foundations below that, all determined from the tartan grid of 600 by 50 millimeters. And in section, we see the uh, timber cross bracing acting in compression rather than tension. And the elevations um, are generated by a combination of this, uh, um, of the method um, and the plan solution the baton cover detail giving their um, dis distinctive expression of the grid dimensions. Uh, and here on the rear, you see the baton cover detail uh, with its very distinctive um, 
yeah, appearance that both the interiors and exteriors of these houses have. Following completion of the first scheme, a second scheme was developed nearby in Honor Oak Park, what was later become Walter's Way for 13 two-story houses. In contrast to the variety of house types in the first phase, where eight types were used for 14 houses, here a different strategy was used with a standardized size, frame and core, uh, and a variety of layouts within the constraint of that 80 meter squared plan structure. This is um, one of those options. The initial opportunity for the first phase of projects was advertised in the local council newspaper, Outlook, with an invitation for people on the council's waiting list. Self-builders were chosen by ballot following a public meeting in 1976, with construction starting in 1979. Residents, residents combined construction with their working lives, during uh, building during evenings, weekends and holidays. All members of the family were encouraged to be involved. Communal works such as the drain runs and raising the uh, two-story frames were shared on an ad hoc basis. And uh, Siegel was joined for these Lewisham projects by John Broom, who became his assistant, as well as being one of the self-builders in Siegel Close. The two of them worked closely with the self-builders on the house designs, suggesting multiple layout options, but also encouraging them to draw their own configurations this is a house plan drawn by one of the phase two builders on squared paper provided by the architects. The architect in this setup was no longer aligned with the project as design authors with a builder set apart uh, and involved in the act of building. Instead, the architect here supports and assists the client who is involved equally in both project design and building construction. See here, uh, the um, drawn and written information uh, followed the pattern established with the pri private houses. Um, but Siegel and Broom also gave a series of evening classes for the self-builders at the local adult evening institute, teaching basic skills. So you see here a 19-week program, two weeks for electric, three for plumbing and so on. Significantly, these were not lessons in general building skills, which would have taken much longer, but just in the essentials required for this fundamentally simple method. It's noteworthy, however, that the self-builders to a large extent learned how to build from each other's on site, rather than from the drawings given by the architects or these instructions. Siegel saying later, this whole experience has taught me uh, personally, an awful lot about human beings. It's taught me an awful lot about the ability provided, uh, which provided the methods of construction not overbearing can be brought to the fore for where people can discover in themselves all kinds of talents, which in their former lives, they had absolutely no opportunity to use. They met le regularly at local uh, pubs and community centers. Uh, this is meeting uh, minutes from the Albany Center in Deptford. Uh, working both independently on their own houses, um, but also as a group on shared endeavors. And they were able to bulk buy much of the material together. This is a shared order list uh, typed out for the phase two wood wall slabs. So you see here the um, regular 600 by 50 miller size, uh, sizes and the standard lengths that they come in and the number that um, they're kind of putting together and ordering together. Um, and similarly here for the external glassal cladding, they're making a combined order list here with the um, panels coming in standard um, widths to standard lengths and their various colors. Um. Importantly, Siegel's method was predicated on assembling materials in their market sizes, and as such had a certain vulnerability to changes in the market. For instance, this letter here from the suppliers uh, notifies the builders that British gypsum had changed the dimensions of its standard gyprock uh, boards. Something that could, uh, when, a, when a system is all predicated on combining market sizes have caused, um, uh, well, been problematic. 
Returning to this detail, however, we see a certain tolerance in the constructional logic. Looking back at this detail here, we see the space here uh, that allows the um, boards, although they're drawn in this drawing to align with the slabs, actually they can accommodate in this space uh, various changes in a, or a degree of change in their lengths. So it also worked at corner junctions as well. So there was a certain um, uh, tolerance within the um, uh, logic that allowed this kind of accommodation of changes to the um, to the market. These following photographs were taken last autumn, showing the schemes as they are now. The um, distinctive uh, country lane urbanism here of Seagull Close. The elegant house built by John Broom for himself there. The vibrant community at Walters Way. The independence and freedom that Siegel sought in his own working methodologies, where he tried as much as possible to take back control of his own circumstances, became evident in the manner he assisted others to control their circumstances, in the broad sense of becoming pr producers rather than consumers but also in the very specific sense of seeking to dis demystify construction as a form of empowerment. After Siegel's death in 1985 and before the completion of Walter's Way, uh, his friend Colin Ward wrote, the most impressive thing about Walter's Siegel was not his wonderfully simple and logical building system. It was the way that step by step in the last 30 years of his practice, he moved to a position which blurs the distinction between architect, builder, and client. They aren't at the three corners of a triangular relationship, but are all mixed up in the middle of the adventure of building. How else, he would ask me teasingly, can you imagine that an anarchist society would work? In conclusion, I agree with Ward that the key significant of Siegel's work was bringing architect, client, and builder into a closer relationship. By making the processes extremely simple, Siegel allowed the client to act as both designer and builder, challenging the separation, closing the distance between project and building. I would differ slightly with Colin Ward uh, in not setting this achievement apart from the technical, suggesting instead that it's very much dependent upon it and born out of the rigorous simplification of building process inherent in that method. Thank you very much.